name is Joseph Marshall, I'm the head here at the school. Um, we're going to be recording this session, so you will be able to watch it. You know other people that have missed it. Um, you can contact Miss Shazza, who brilliantly organises the event and she'll where all the things are housed in terms of links, etc. Um, very lucky today, medicine, and with two um, brilliant people. So we've got Dr. David Russell from the University of Georgia to have a look at uh, medicine in the UK. We've also got Dr. Chien, for who by UCD Malaysia. So again, um, Irish institutions that are in Malaysia. So she'll be able to be Ireland, but obviously about um, the, the here in Malaysia too. So without any further ado, we're going to start the lecture. So I'm going to hand over now to um, Dr. David Russell and he will. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to attempt to share my screen and my virtual background looks a little bit um, hazy, but this is um, beautiful scenery in Dundee in the background. Um, we sit over a river. I've got some, uh, some nice pictures in my presentation. So let me just share this one now. So I'm going to go to full screen mode. OK. Can you see that OK? Yep, all good. OK, great stuff. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me to, um, to give a presentation to you. So I'm uh, David Russell. I'm the international lead for the School of Medicine at the University of Dundee. Um, if you haven't been to the UK and you might not know where Dundee is, um, we are in the northeast of Scotland. Um, so this gives you an idea of the kind of travel times. So we're everywhere in Scotland is quite um quite close. We're a small country. We have a total population of um, 5 million, um, so very, very small. And um, it's easy to get here. Um, direct flights in from many destinations um, and London. Um, you can fly from Dundee to London in about an hour um, or Edinburgh and Glasgow is closer by. So this is um, actually from across the river that you saw in the first picture, looking at the city of Dundee. Um, so it's quite a small city. It has a population of about 250,000. Um, so very much smaller than KL. Um, and it, but it has everything that a city has to offer. And again, this is another view. And this gives you an idea looking across at Dundee. So it gives you an idea of the size of it. But actually, the good thing about being in Scotland is that actually you don't have to travel very far before you're into nice open spaces and lots of um, greenery and um, mountains, etc. So some really nice scenery. This is the Victoria and Albert Museum. So you may have heard, heard of the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Um, they had they didn't have enough space for all their exhibitions. So there was a huge international competition to find an architect and a location. And Dundee was lucky enough to be selected for that. So this is down on the waterfront again. Again, a really nice place to go and see exhibitions um, and um, have a hang around. So from the sky, this is the University of Dundee. Now, this is the central campus. And the medical school isn't in this picture, but this gives you an idea of kind of the, some of the buildings that we have. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but if you can, um, this is kind of this is student accommodation. And again, this is a city centre, so where the shops are. Um, this is the School of Life Sciences. Um, if you come here to study medicine, you will spend quite a lot of time in this um, this department. Here, this is our anatomy department. Now at Dundee, we are very lucky. Um, in two things that we still use um, full body um, dissection. So you will dissect a cadaver um, during your studies. And we're even more lucky in that we're the only institute in the UK that have moved to uh, a new method of embalming cadaver cadavers called teal. So the cadavers are very flexible, much more realistic and a much better experience for studying um, anatomy. So all this information is available on the web. So we've got about 17,000 students. Um, we're a major contributor to the local economy and obviously within the health service um, as well. So this is um, about two and a half miles away from the previous picture. 
and this is Nine Wells Hospital. So it's a major hospital in Scotland, one of the major ones. We've got 827 beds. Um, all major specialties are covered. The only thing we don't do, we don't do transplant surgery. You will tend to go to Aberdeen for that. And we don't do cardiothoracic surgery. You would tend to go to Glasgow for that. Um, Scotland is small enough and the health service is organised in a way that it's easy for us to share um, services. So we don't all have to offer everything. We are a major trauma centre, so here in the grounds you can see um, the helipad um, where trauma can be um, flown in. But where we differ from a lot of uh, medical schools, and again it's a really, um, we're very, very lucky and it's one of the things that the students really like, um, in, this, in this huge hospital complex, this building right in the middle is the medical school. So you don't have to travel very far to see patients and you have access to all these clinical facilities. And the other pictures you can see, they are from outside of the main entrance of the hospital and that is the medical school library. Um, so our students spend a lot of time in their um, personal study and accessing resources. So a lot of our students will say they came to Dundee because the medical school is right within um, the hospital. Again, all this information is um, on the web, but you know we take our student satisfaction very um, seriously, and that includes um, our international students who give us very high um, ratings across a number of different areas. And um, so we're very proud and we put a lot of effort into supporting students as all um, universities do. Um, if you come to Dundee, we have modern accommodation um, and, you know, all the rankings that we look at. So we're definitely, we're up there in some of the best accommodation um, in universities in the UK. If you do come to Dundee, um, you're guaranteed accommodation if you apply by the deadline. Um, the price you pay includes all your bills. So you've got all your electricity bills are included, Wi-Fi is included, um, insurance for your personal possessions etc and we have a lot of on-site security um, secure entrance um, security staff accommodation tends to be shared so you will have around five or six bedrooms that have your own um, ensuite facilities and a shared kitchen and um, uh, living space when you apply for accommodation you can request um, special considerations so if you want to be in a in a flat where everybody is vegetarian or you don't want to be you want to be in a flat where there's no alcohol then you can request that and they will match you up and um, to make sure that that's um, met after first year most students make friends in their course and they'll move out into private accommodation and the university will look after and regulate that so you can be you can be guaranteed that you know you're not going to be um, paying over the amount that you should be, et cetera, or in an unsafe um, accommodation. So that's all kind of the university stuff in the accommodation. The bit you really want to know about is um, the medical degree. So we offer an MBCHB. Some medical degrees have different names. And um, we're very proud um, that we've just been ranked number one in the UK in two separate um, different um, rankings. Um, you know, we strive, we're always in the top five, but we're um, really pleased um, to be in, um, ranked number one um, in this, uh, this cycle. Um, this picture here, hopefully you can see we have a really good relationship with our students. These students, um, this photograph was taken a few years ago. This is in the middle of the medical school and they're all looking very happy because they've literally just been told about 10 minutes before this picture was taken that they're now qualified doctors. Um, and I always know my place, I get to hand round um, the snacks. Um, so we like to celebrate their achievement. We get to know our students very well. So we have an integrated curriculum. And what that means is that we build knowledge and clinical um, exposure. And we use clinical exposure to reinforce the knowledge. So your knowledge and your skills build as you go up the spiral. And um, when you join us as a new student, you become a student doctor. So you have a role to play. We, um, you know, you're not just, a, we tend not to talk about medical students anymore. We talk about student doctors and we will build your knowledge and test uh, all the way up until you qualify with your medical degree. Through the spiral, as well as building knowledge, we also have vertical themes as we call them. And these are things that we place great importance on and they can be professionalism, ethics and everything we do will have a, um, will have a 
a professionalism aspect or an ethical aspect and various others. And they run the whole way up um, the, the spiral. So the medical degree at Dundee is kind of split into two um, different parts. The first part is called systems in practice. Um, and actually this picture is, um, is borrowed from our dental colleagues, but we do this as well. And um, so one of the ways we, you know, we like to try and teach things uh, in, a, you know, in a different way to make them as fun as we can. So in our, in our anatomy um, classes, you will have the opportunity to, um, you know, to draw surface muscles and nerves and blood vessels um, onto, onto each other. Um, it really helps with the understanding. So in years one to three, Things um, are probably slightly more you would expect to have at university. So you will have lectures, you will have tutorials, but you will have a lot of clinical experience. Um, we um, are well known for our early, early patient exposure. And again, one of the things that students really like about Dundee. And you will actually meet your first patient in week one of first year. Um, so you get to meet your patients very, very early. Now we're undergoing a curriculum review. If you apply to Dundee and start um, and two years time it will be now or next year then it won't affect you but um, it will come in in the future just uh, we have to change things every so often um, so in year one um, you will follow these um, blocks that you can see so principles just make sure everybody's scientific knowledge is up to speed and you start your anatomy um, lectures you also have your introduction to clinical skills communication skills and then we offer a systems-based approach. Now, when I talk about a system, so um, cardiovascular is a system. So when you do your cardiovascular block, you will learn about the cardiovascular system. Your dissection will cover the cardiovascular system. You'll learn how to do cardiovascular clinical um, examinations. You'll learn how to prescribe drugs for cardiovascular disease. And you'll obviously meet patients who have cardiovascular disease. So we keep it as a self-contained um, unit. And then you move on. But every so often, we have these um, blocks called CLASP and CLASP is clinical um, application of scientific principles so that's where we just pause for a, a while and we look at different blocks that you've covered previously and we join them together so um, if you're looking at a blood test result what indication might it be that actually it could be a respiratory problem, cardiovascular or GI problem, for example, um, or if somebody suddenly died, what would you look for and how would you would link the different blocks um, together. So we get you to think about things in the bigger picture as well. Much of the course uh, in the uh, medical courses in the UK have to be directed by you. Um, the GMC say 25% of the curriculum should be self-directed. So we have these blocks called student selected components. And this is where you can start to develop your interests um, and you can pick projects that you know relate to your interests and build your, um, your interest as you go through. And they happen every, every year. So you go through years one, two, and three, and um, you build, uh, do all these blocks. You have exams at the end of each year. Um, again, so this is one of our lectures. So one of the few times um, all the students in a year are together is in the lectures in years one, two, and three. And um, this is one of our lecture theatres, um, nice modern facilities. Uh, this is another one of our lecture theatre, and you might see that this looks very different. So we do a lot of TBL, so team-based learning. So when we built this lecture theatre, we designed it so people could work in groups and then come back together and present. Now, you will spend a lot of time. This is Ward 77 in Nine Wales Hospital. Um, it is... It looks like a ward in the hospital, um, it has all the facilities, etc. but it's a simulation ward. So this is where we teach you how to develop your skills in a safe environment where you can make mistakes and um, you, know, you can learn from those mistakes. And we don't just have medical students here. So these are some nursing students um, undergoing training. And we also, um, we also bring everybody together. So we have um, exercises where nurses, dentists, and medi um, medical students come together to learn. So you will spend a lot of time in this facility. And obviously, as your um, experience grows, um, you will learn um, more and more in-depth skills. So this is in our um, simulated high dependency unit. And this is a student undergoing um, their basic life support training um, before they go into their clinical areas. And we use this area for um, sim OSCEs, the clinical exams, and running the ward simulation exercise, where we give you an opportunity to actually run a ward as a junior doctor. This is for our final year students and um, to give them a real experience around prioritization and clinical decision making under pressure. 
So after years uh, one, two, and three, you go into preparation and practice. Now, this is really where you move into the purely clinical phase. Um, so at the end of year three and beginning of year four, we have your transition block. Now, this is where we teach you everything you really need to know to be working in the clinical environment. So how to use the IT systems. Um, we also teach things how to recognize a patient who's um, rapidly deteriorating, the early signs of sepsis, et cetera. How to, um, you know, everything that you need to know, how to scrub up in theater, which you will have done before you get to fourth year, but just to make sure everybody has that. Then you will go into your core clinical placements in year four, and you will cover each of these areas. Now, you don't have lectures or tutorials anymore. All your teaching is done now in the clinical environment. So you will spend all your time in the hospital, um, apart from when you go out to a general uh, practice. You will have a clinical SSC where you can do things clinically that, you know, interest you, and there are lots and lots of options. We offer the option to go on a longitudinal clerkship. So instead of rotating around medical um, specialties, we give you the option that you can go out into a rural community and be attached to a local um, general practitioner and you will have your own patients and um, you don't have to do that, but it is an option that um, people um, do like to do. At the end of fourth year, you will have your final knowledge exams. So this is by the end of fourth year, we've taught you everything that you need to know to graduate. And then in fifth year, it really is about learning how to be a junior doctor. So we have, um, we call them apprenticeship blocks. So you will spend time again, all in the clinical environment where you will be attached um, to a foundation doctor. You will learn what they do. They will, you know, you'll learn um, on, on the job as such. And um, you will do night shifts in A&E. You will go out with the ambulance service. So you'll get a real experience of the whole kind of focus of the NHS and what you're about to um, experience and you will do an SS two SSCs in fifth year and you will also have your elective where you can go anywhere in the world and you can see medicine in different contexts so many students from the UK will go to Asia India they go all over all over the world and you organize that yourself so we do try to make it as real as possible. Um, the picture of the leg is not real we have makeup artists who are experts in um, you know, creating wounds, etc., burns um, to add to the realism. And this is a student um, code red day, it's called uh, a part of tr the um, trauma training. And this is where you will actually, you know, a, a major disaster, how you deal with it. So you will triage how you're going to handle patients. Will you, um, you know, who's going to be seen first, what roles people have. So you organize all this. We also work with the local fire service, paramedics, teaching you how to extract people from cars um, and obviously not when they're on fire but we do make it real so you see the roles that different people have so it's very much understanding what everybody does in a team so again you can get all this I'm not going to spend time on this because you can get all this on um, on the web about the entrance requirements um, roughly three years at a level or a minimum of 37 at IB um, the fees for medicine are um, are high um, and we are kind of average um, for medicine in the UK. You will have to sit the UCAT, must be completed prior to your UCAS application. Um, so again, it can be taken from July to October. I advise that you book early. We don't advertise a cutoff score because everybody is compared to everybody who's taken it in that cycle. But looking over the years, the average score for people that we select for interview is around 2,700, but it does go up and down. We will take your school grades and we will put 60% weighting on them. Um, and we will take your UCAT score and put 40% weighting on that. And that will be used to calculate your academic score. Now, um, if you, um, and that's what we will use to decide who we're going to invite for interview. So again, this um, summarizes it again. So we have 157 places, but reasonably small. Um, there are bigger um, medical schools. We receive about 1800 applications. We obviously want to get the best medical students that we can that are going to fit in with the way we teach medicine. So we interview a lot of people. And last year we interviewed 800 people and we make um, more offers than we have places for because people will sometimes have more offers or they won't meet, meet their offer. So we, all medical schools will make extra, extra offers for the places that they have. 
Now, when you're completing your personal statement, we want to see that you're a balanced individual. So we want evidence that you have an interest outside of academic study. We don't want just to see that you're purely academic because these you know, people tend to burn out because um, medicine's quite, a, you know, it's a full on course. If you're lucky enough to have had shadowing experience, and if you're even luckier that you've had multiple shadowing experiences with uh, clinicians, don't list them all. Pick a couple, and what we actually want to see is what did you learn from those experiences, and what did it teach you about yourself, and why did it reinforce your wish to study medicine? So we use multiple mini interviews. Again, um, we M MMIs are based on the OSCE, and um, we most medical schools now will use MMIs. Um, Again, we don't want to put you through an experience that is like The Apprentice. We don't want to see how much pressure you can take. Um, MMIs should actually be a, a positive experience. And we use them because they produce a huge amount of data. They're very reliable and they're based on the OSCE. So if you're good at MMI, you're likely to be good at OSCEs. And unlike being on The Apprentice, it lets you recover if a station didn't go well because you can put it behind you and move on to the next one. So if we asked you what we would look for in a medic, we'd probably, you know, you could probably come up with this list. So kind of communication, empathy, moral reasoning, teamwork, um, critical thinking, and knowledge. Um, if we wanted to test these in an MMI station, then obviously if we wanted to test your communication skills, we might ask you to take part in a difficult situation. Can you present a cohesive argument? You know, can you see both sides of an argument? Can you um, maintain appropriate tone and eye contact? And you're non-confrontational in your approach. So we kind of have a set list of things that we look at. Now, as I say, we, you will get this presentation because I've got my timer here and I know it's approaching my 20 minutes. Um, so again, teamwork, critical thinking and knowledge. So um, yeah, these are the kind of skills that we would test in an MMI. Post-graduation, everybody who studies medicine in the UK, no matter where you are from, is eligible to apply for foundation training. Um, a good source of information is the Medical Schools Council website. They have information about getting into medical school, what medical school is like, and what happens after medical school, including the career pathways that you can take. And being, even being an international um, student, you're eligible to apply for all these, um, for all these um, processes. After your FY2, when you get your GMC registration, you go into specialty training. And really, as everywhere, job prospects are excellent. There are very, very few unemployed doctors and the salaries are um, good. Um, as an FY1 doctor, you will make about 28 to 30,000 pounds per year. That will go up quite quickly. And by the time you reach consultancy level, um, you will be making up to up to £130,000 a year in the National Health Service. If you go private, um, I have a friend who's a private dermatologist and makes around £2,500 per day. So there's a lot of money that um, you can make. Um, so even though it's expensive to study, you can, you will make that money back. Um, so um, thank you very much. Um, this is Vivian, who is here today, who is um, our agent in Dundee and uh, in Malaysia, and will be able, able to answer any questions that you have. My email address is there. Um, please feel free to email either of us if you have any questions. Um, we will share this presentation with you so you can have all the information. And I'm happy to follow up if anybody has any extra questions. So um, thank you very much for um, allowing me to sh um, speak to you today. And I look forward to answering any questions from you later on. Thank you. Thank you. That's great, David. And just to just to reiterate, on to Dr. Chien to talk about UCD, RCSI, Malaysia. Um, just to say, put into the chat if, if if you want, please do so. Um, medicine, we've got the technical side of the. This is a real vocation as well. So there's to know about being a doctor, what it's like profession, because um, this is perhaps a bit standard program of study. So well educated people in that area do if you'd want to. I'm now going to move on now to Dr. Chien. So Dr. Chien, would you like to present and tell us a bit about it? Yes, hi. I'll just share my screen now.
Can you see my screen? Yep, all good. We certainly can. Excellent. Good afternoon. Hi, I'm Dr. Chen. I'm speaking from Penang. I'm a senior lecturer in family medicine and also the vice dean of students from RUMC. Thank you for having me. Now, um, I can recall how stressful it is trying to think of what to study, what course to study, and also I suppose to pick a career at this age, um, the process can be quite stressful for both parents and um, students. I suppose the thinking process, um, the first thing is that students, you must be interested in the topic and also next ask yourself, uh, why do I like medicine? Why am I studying medicine? I just put up a slide uh, here to show that why I picked medicine in the first place, right? You, you have your own choice. You have your own reasons. Okay, let's say you are ready now. You've decided that you want to study medicine. The series of questions that will uh, need to be answered. The first question, do I have the right skill for this course? Next is which university do I pick? What are the curriculum? How much is the cost? And what's the entry requirement? Also, what happened after I graduate? What are the possible career pathway? Therefore, I'm going to cover these topics and um, I'll talk about RUMC. Uh, this is a university that I know best. And also I've been working here for the last 17 years. The first question is, do I have the right skill to study medicine? Having good results, is not enough to study medicine. You have to be interested in people and their problems. Good communication skills are important and reasonable maturity is important as well. That's the reason why all medical school, they conduct interviews for admissions. All right, now this slide, uh, RUMC stands for RCSI and UCD Malaysia campus is established in 1996 and previously uh, a lot of you may have heard is called PMC, Penang Medical College. It's owned by RCSI and UCD so it's a full Irish owned medical school. It is a foreign university branch campus and we have graduated 1900 medical graduates so far is accredited in Malaysia and Europe, and the graduates can practice in Ireland, UK, North America, and many countries around the world. See, the foreign campus, the, the beauty of, of foreign campus is that you graduate, you receive exactly the same cert as the students who did full five-year course overseas, either in RCSI or UCD obviously you save in the cost. And when you return to Malaysia to study the, the second two and a half years, the cost of living is lower. So our students receive three certificates when they graduate. One, this is um, by NUI, National University of Ireland, and also two licenses from RCS, RCSI and RCPI. All right. Now, the course takes five years and 10 semesters. The first two and a half years will be done in Dublin. You can choose either RCSI or UCD. You leave Malaysia, you start in Dublin, either one of these hospitals, one of these university. At the end of second two and a half years, you return to Penang and you study in RUMC. Now I just introduced a little bit about RCSI. RCSI is in Dublin, right in the city of Dublin. It's uh, founded, what, 250 years ago. And it focuses on medicine and health science subjects only. It's a lot, Ireland's largest medical school. It ranked top 2% in Times Higher World University ranking. And it has about 3,500 students from 60 nationalities. And they have a very large modern medical clinical simulation center. 
it's um, very research active. Uh, a lot of our students spend their summer doing research projects. And um, the good thing is you are paid helping them to do research and also get your publication. And UCD is slightly uh, younger. It's very modern. It's very large. It's a, a university that offers 70 degrees, but it's not just medicine or health science. It has 30,000 students from 120 countries. And again, it ranks very high and it has the uh, research intensive university facilities as well. Now, just to show you RCSI, uh, these are the buildings. And I said before, the clinical similar centers is a very impressive, spent a lot of money building such a simulation centers, the largest in the, uh, Europe. And the uh, facilities, again, the gym, the uh, library, study area, student center, UCD, as I said, is really big, modern, uh, about 132 acres. It's about four kilometers from the uh, city center of Dublin. It's not far. And these are the um, facilities again, nice pool. And uh, UCD, the student center, some huge, huge library here. And the student life, these are our students. And you can see the event Relay for Life. We have it here as well. So uh, when you come back to Penang, if you're active, you'll join similar activities here, um, barbecue. <laughs> and also we have International Night. And RUMC is in Penang, Georgetown. It's right in the middle of uh, Georgetown as well. It is a clinical school. So what is important in clinical school is their hospitals, <clears throat> because this is where you learn. You learn from patients. We are very lucky because we have three hospitals here that we can use. We are the sole user in terms of medical school of Hospital Prapinang and Hospital Subarang Jaya. Nobody else is competing with us. You can't get it anywhere in Malaysia. Usually it's very crowded. You get four or five medical schools sharing one hospital. Hospital being we're still using, uh, we, we are sharing with an other university. All right, Penang um, is a very touristy place, uh, very nice, the island itself. It's a UNESCO World Cultural Heritage. And um, I think, you know, people come here for food. The street food is world famous. And some photos of student life, these are the graduation lecture theater, um, some classes. Okay, now the next topic is um, how do you get yourself admitted to RUMC? There are three methods. Most people will use their A level or equivalent results to apply to the uh, medical degree in RUMC. For A level, you need A, B, B in biology, chemistry, then mathematics or physics. All right. If you're not able to get an A, B, B, then you can apply to study one extra year, which is the pre medical year. After the pre medical years, then you start your five year degree. There's another way, which is the shortest. After your IGCSE or equivalent, you can apply to join the foundation in size. And with the GCPA of 3.5 to 4, you qualify to start the medical degree, five-year medical degree. OK, the program de de uh, delivery, we are quite similar to Dundee, but perhaps we are not as integrated. It's system-based. You have cardiovascular, central nervous, all the systems here. And each system, you cover anatomy, biochemistry. And like Dundee, the anatomy is uh, you, you, you dissect on the real cadaver. Uh, pathology, microbiology, those preclinical pre subjects. And when you return to Malaysia, after you finish the two and a half years, so you start the third year, second half, and it's pure clinical, you have clinical skills. We have a clinical skills unit in Sabrang Jaya and you learn all these clinical subjects. All right, 
um, at the end of the uh, two and a half years in Penang, you graduate, as I show you, you get the three nice big certs. Now, what happened after the five years? Everybody need to do internship or some of us call it housemanship. You can do it in Malaysia or abroad. You can apply to UK, to, uh, to Australia, to Ireland, a lot of country you can apply. Some you need to sit for the entrance exam. So some internship one year, some two years. So at the end of the housemanship internship, then one would think about specializing as you enter your senior house officer or medical officer, what specialty you'll be thinking about applying. Uh, for example, you can be a general physician, you can do all the subspecialties, cardiologists, respiratory physicians, be a surgeon. And for a surgeon, again, there are many specialties. Like myself, I specialize in family medicine and also I do the academic, I have both clinical practice and doing academic jobs. Um, can be ONG specialists, anesthetists, many, endless. Okay, I'll show you where I have, I, I, I tried very hard to find some pictures, but um, I managed to find only a few. Like for example, uh, Dr. Uh, this James, James is now a um, surgeon, colorectal surgeon, he's still in Malaysia. Dr. Disraj, he's in Canada, he is a cardiologist. And Dr. Ui, he is now in the UK. He's emergency medicine specialist. And Dr. Tan is in USA. Dr. Tio, he is in the kidney transplant program in Canada, Ontario. And Dr. Jasima, he, he, she is in Ireland. So our student, when you graduate, you do not stay, have to be uh, stuck in Malaysia. Your degree is able to allow you to practice in many countries in the world. Um, please visit our website. Um, I'm, op you, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Chien. That's really, really brilliant. Well, we've got some questions um, for both of our um, brilliant participants today, and I'll be reading those from the chat as I can. Um, the first one probably is going to be a bit more for you, um, Dr. Russell, just because I think we've kind of covered really with that last presentation about the fact that obviously you can practice with that degree in Malaysia if you wish to, although there are some other options. Um, with regard to Dundee's degree, um, what, what do you know about practicing back here in Malaysia? What is the what is the, the recourse for doing that? Yeah, the um, Dundee medical degree is accredited in Malaysia. Um, so if you don't um, want to stay in um, the UK to do your foundation um, post, which I would thoroughly recommend, um, because you get um, because you get GMC registration, it's a very very useful thing to have. So a, it's it is recognised in many countries of the world. Um, and but the big th the big plus is that if you ever do want to come back to the UK to work, you won't have to sit the entrance exams that you would have to sit um, to come back into the UK. Currently called the PLAB, but it's about to be um, changed. So yes, um, Dundee is recognised in Malaysia. We keep our accreditation up to. Um, up to date. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Okay, okay I can move on to the next question. Um, again, obviously, this is a very, a, a really good question, I think, and it's obviously a very pertinent one because of the current situation we're facing at the moment. Uh, and that's due to COVID-19, but a lot of students who are not able to do work experience either in hospitals or even more, you know, directly within the caring industry. So for both of our participants, really, I mean, would you accept virtual work experience in whatever form as a replacement for physical work experience at this time? Uh, perhaps David, if you want to go first. Yeah. Um, so we, we know how difficult it is to actually get clinical um, shadowing experience. So we don't say that you have to have it. We don't have it as a requirement. We will have expected you to make some attempt to understand what medicine involves now that can be um with a pharmacist or you know in an elderly care home something that gives you an idea of you know medicine as 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 um as a as a subject we we get people who do lots of interesting things so i mean i know people that are applying um this year 
have with the COVID-19. They've been involved in organising community um, resources to help people that are vulnerable. Um, you know, and that's that is the kind of thing that we're looking for. People that have got initiative and have actually, you know, done something to support their community. They've taken, you know, because what we want to see is, you know, we and that's why I said in my presentation, that if you're lucky enough that you're in a family who have, have got uh, medics and you can get access to um, shadowing, we don't want you to list them all because actually what we want to know is what did that teach you about, you know, the experience? What did you gain from it? And actually you can gain a lot from organising um, a support network for vulnerable members of the community. You can, as long, you know, we will ask you about that. Fantastic. And Dr. Chair, just for work experience, for your institution, how how does that fit in with you? Okay, it is uh, encourage is not compulsory. The students are required to write a personal statement, and we do look at it. It certainly will be positive to have those experience. But for those who have not, we can look like look into. Let's say the students have uh, joint St. John's, and we see what kind of activities they have they've mm -hmm. done, or maybe they help out in the nursing home. And um, for example, now with COVID, some people help out like a volunteer and um, even deliver food and they, they prepare the facials and th those uh, we, we would take it positively in their personal statement. So it's, it's not necessary, not compulsory, I say. Yeah, excellent. Okay, great, it's very clear. Um, we've got a couple of questions very quickly on the grade side of things. We've got someone asking about how IGCSE or GCSE results are, are configured into their assessment um, criteria and also again um, obviously it was where UK A level school um, whether there's much of a preference for doing either four A levels or perhaps perhaps more standard route now here of doing three A levels and an EPQ so again perhaps David if you want to start with that one and then we can move on to Dr. Sheehan again. Um, yeah so we do look at your GCSE results um, you have to have passed them we don't grade them as such um, so the requirements, and we will expect you to have had certain, um, so biology, we, we ask you to have a GCSE if you ha haven't got it at A level. Like most medical schools, for, um, we don't ask, we, do, we put more emphasis on chemistry and physics um, than biology. Um, so we do look at your GCSE results, but we don't grade them. Your grading is based on your A levels or your IB. We will recognise um, additional, um, you know, if you've got four A levels, then um, you know you will get extra credit for that, but it can balance out. So if you're not doing four, then don't don't worry about that too much because you have the opportunity to adjust the balance with your UCAT score. So if you have a better UCAT score, then it would it would even things out a little bit. Um, David, I'll just pick up on one very quickly on the GCSE because I know it comes up a lot about whether people have done the double science or the triple science award. Is, is that something you particularly? Um, look for on the GCSE profile? Um, no, um, as I say, so on our, um, we have different um, requirements for different countries, but if you go onto the university website and select Malaysia, it will give you a breakdown of exactly what we want and it will say what we require you to have at GCSE, a, at GCSE level um, if you haven't done these A levels. So it can, um, it can vary, but really we would expect you to have um, chemistry and um, one other science, um, at least at A level. Um, and Dr. Chair, and just moving over to you. Thank you, um, David. Um, just, I guess, with the EPQ, I know, I know that again in the UK, that's very much a qualification they look for. Is that something that you're aware of, or or, or you look at when you're making assessment? No, we look at the uh, purely the A level results, and um, we need biology, chemistry, then either mathematics or physics. So you do not need to take three sizes. Yeah, just the, just the three there, brilliant. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I think there's a few questions about um, international students and international cutoff. I mean, I'll, I'll just say very quickly that the standard in the UK, it's about 7.5% of any given places at most UK medical schools are allocated to international students, which was non-EU students, and now pretty much means non-UK students. Um, but in terms of the overall competitive, competitiveness for international students, um, David, are you able to give us any more kind of information around that? Um, yeah, so actually, so 
seven and a half percent is correct, and obviously that will now include students from the EU. Because of the um, the student funding rules in the EU, I don't. We're not expecting that many students will choose to come um, to the UK to study medicine because the fees are um, high, and you can go to any country in the EU and study and only pay home fees. Um, so I would imagine people will go. Um, to Europe for the because of the financial side of it. Um, in terms of um, competitiveness, actually, we will be competing for you um, in most medical schools. So again, so we have you know about two thousand applications per year, even though we only have a small number of places for international students. The the um, ratio of people who apply to the um, to the places is less than it is for our home students. So there's less competition for those places. In the UK, you're limited to the number of UCAS applications that you can make, um, which you will be, um, but also you will be able, you will probably be considering other universities in other countries for Australia, um, etc. One thing we, dis we, we know is that international students tend to be very highly qualified. Um, they tend to perform well at MMI. So actually we tend to compete a little bit for international students. So we'll make a, a higher number of proportion of offers to overseas students than we would to our home students. So we consider everybody by their, their fee status, as we call it. Um, and we look over the years to see, okay, how many offers did we make? How many people accepted? And we try to work out ratios. It's not an exact science. And so we will actually make more offers for international students um, because you tend to be very well qualified. So you probably have more than one offer and you know you will be considering going to other countries whereas UK students tend not to travel abroad um, to study. So even though the numbers are small, you actually have a good chance. And one thing I, I didn't say in my talk, um, which is important is your academic score and your UCAT score is how we consider who we're going to interview. Once we select you, once we select you for interview, all your academic scores are put to the side, and then it's all about your performance in the interview. Um, so if you can get yourself invited to interview, then um, then you're in, in a good chance of getting an offer. Across the whole board, if you can get invited for interview, you roughly have a fifty percent chance of being given an offer, which is pretty good odds. Yeah, that's that's really great to know. Um, I'll very quickly just on. Uh, I'll come back to that point in a second. Just to Dr. Chian, is, is, do you have any demographic concerns at all? I mean, you pretty much have no limit to, to where students are from and what and who you will accept. A majority of our students are from Malaysia. We have uh, about 10% are international students. The, the students come from even UK, they come, come to RUMC, <coughs> Australia, Thailand. Um, what else do we get? Indonesia. Sri Lanka, India. So we have uh, about 10% of international students. Fantastic, okay. Got a couple more, so these are prep. So we've got, again, I think just going back on to what we were just discussing, um, um, Dr. Russell. Again, I, I think you've maybe covered it, but I think it's, this is just another way of looking at it in a more specific way. So someone's asked if they were to have three A-levels, but another student had four A-levels, um, and they both had the, the same UK SAT score, would you feel that one would, the four A-levels would outweigh the three A-levels? So it's, again, it's, it's sort of going back to the different yeah. ways in which you assess the different aspects of the application. They would have, an, they would higher, have a higher academic score. Um, so we look at, you know, the point system for A-levels, and we, can, we look at the number of points you've got across for, for your A-levels out of the maximum possible that you could get um, from your um, your grading. And then we basically make you an academic score out of 10. So obviously somebody who had four A-levels would have a higher um, academic. It depends on the grades. Um, you know, so somebody's got four A's um, and, you know, we do get people um, and, you know, they're low in number and, you know, don't, don't be put off, but, you know, we do get people who apply have got five A's. Um, from certain countries, um, but it depends on the grades and it depends on the UCAT. Now we do interview a lot of people. So overseas um, students, because the number of applicants is lower, we, we will interview a higher proportion of that group compared to other students. Um, so, you know, we have about 2000 applications 
for um, roughly 157 places, about 300 of them will be from overseas students. And obviously that leaves 1,700 people who are applying for the home places. So actually we will interview more people and we, we know that overseas students are, are tend to be um, better qualified. Um, and so we, we know that we have to interview more. So because we rely on the MMI, we can't make you an offer unless, unless you have been through the MMI. So we can't go back to people in the future if we can't fill our, it doesn't happen, but if we can't fill our places, we couldn't then go and offer somebody who hadn't been through the multiple mini interviews. So that's why last year we interviewed, it was 811 people. Um, so a, a big proportion of people. So even if you're an international student and you have three A's and you've got a decent UCAT score, uh, you will probably be um, selected for interview. We will be doing virtual interviews this year. Who knows what happens next year? Normally, we also come out to Malaysia and run MMIs in Malaysia. So we have a strong relationship with IMU um, in a similar fashion um, to what you've heard about the Penang Medical School. We take students from IMU who do two and a half years at IMU and then they join Dundee and in, into third year, um, which is another route that people um, you know, can consider. Um, as a way of transferring to another medical school. So we have a, a big proportion of Malaysian students, Malaysian, Singapore, Indian students amongst our international, um, particularly through the IMU route. So I hope that answers the question. That, that's really great, fantastic. Um, I mean, I'll just very quickly say, obviously different medical schools have different ways of doing these calculations. So as David was saying, you know, they might put 40% on the UCAS and 40% on this and then have rounds of it. Each medical school might have its own approach to that. So just bearing that in mind, that's something definitely to look at when you're researching medical schools in the first instance. Um, just got a question. I think we kind of have covered this, but in terms of what subject students would be expected to take at A-level um, um, for studying medicine in the UK, chemistry would always be pretty much the mandatory one for most places. Biology would be highly, highly regarded. Um, David, do you have any, do you have much preference for the kind of third A level particularly? We're normally quite open for students. I mean, maths yeah, is a common um, one, but really anything is often um, fine, I would say. Yeah, um, so we also, cl we class maths as a science. So quite often you'll get people with maths, chemistry and physics. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, chemistry, we, we look for um more people would have physics than biology, but again, it, it doesn't matter. It's about the grades. Um, so again, on our website, you can look by country and select, you know, um, and see the subjects that we would that we would want. But certainly, chemistry. Yeah, the so chem really the dominant one, and then you will find this variation between institutions that perhaps talk about what else may well want. Uh, very quickly, Dave, this on the UCAT test. I don't know how much you can go. Perhaps not the easiest question to answer in terms of say, excuse, saying how long would you need to study for it, but perhaps that's just a, a very, very quick understanding of what the UCAT test actually tests for might perhaps be a better way of, uh, of looking at it. Yeah. So the UCAT tests um, a variety. There's four different areas that it tests. Now, you can prepare um, slightly, I think, for the UCAT test. The thing is, you have to be doing it at pace so that what the UCAT is actually looking for is your ability to, you know, moral reasoning, et cetera, under pressure, you know, under where you don't have time to answer questions. So it's judging your initial thoughts um, and your thought processes. So if you are going to practice for the UCAT, make sure you do it, um, you, that you do it in timed um, situations to get used to that feeling of the fast paced environment. Because um, if you look at the individual UCAT kind of questions, there's examples on the web, they're not that complicated. Um, again, it's how you do it under, um, under timed conditions. Um, so there's four components. Um, the fourth one, situational um, judgment, we, you get a banding. Um, and we don't use that. Um, we will exclude you if you get a band four, which suggests that your kind of situational judgment level is not compatible with um, study in medicine so we would um we would drop your application at that point but apart from that's the only time we would use that um i saw somebody asking about um cut off scores we don't advertise a cut off score because you are you're compared to everybody who's taken the ucat in the same cycle so the the average goes up and down um and so you know we don't 
say, I mean, I presented an average score, but again, that can, you know, if you actually look to the upper and lower limits of that, I mean, it would be, you know, almost a couple of hundred points um, because it does go up and down. Um, so, yeah, we don't advertise a cutoff, but about 2,700 would be competitive. Um, again, we get people that have got over 3,000. We've got people who have got 2,400 who we select for interview. Um, so, yeah, give it your best shot. Um, you, ha ha you can't do it twice in the same year. So the score you get is the score you get. We, you can, we, we allow um, second applications. So if you're not um, selected for interview, um, you can reapply the following year, but you would have to take the UCAT again. Thank you, that's fantastic. We've, now we've got a lot of questions that have come in generally about entry requirements. We've all covered a lot of those. So again, you can email me um, or either of the participants to get more detail on those, but, but we cover those. I think I've got two more questions really. Um, one, um, I think just for you, David, and then one for both of you to finish, and they kind of revolve around, again, either end of the, of, of the system. So one was just an, a final one, David, on work experience. So someone was asking about also working with animals. That's, that's quite common out here, just where, where we are. Is that something, again, that if you can convert that into a, into a good experience in terms of caring that can be used? Yeah, so in our multiple mini interview, we have two stations that is about your personal statement. So we don't use your personal statement as a selection criteria to decide who we're going to interview. But you will have two stations in your um, MMI that will be about your personal statement. One station will look at your kind of medical experience. Now, that can be um, around um, working with animals because we will have a discussion with you. So we'll ask you, okay, what did you do? What was your role within the team? What did it teach you about teamwork? How might you apply that to a career in medicine? You know, what did you learn about yourself? What did you find most difficult? So the experience can be, um, you know, that's why we don't say you have to have done this, you know, and a prescriptive list of what's acceptable because it's more about what you learn from that. So we will ask you about that. The other station about your MMI, will be around what you do outside of medicine. So people will, um, you know, talk about, again, you know, sports or music or drama. And again, the conversation we will have with you is about, okay, what did you learn from that? Um, so we really get to, um, medicine is about reflection. Um, you know, in medical school, you will reflect, you will reflect, and you will reflect some more. And it's a, it's a, it's a definite skill. So using those stations, we want to see if you've got that, um, ability to reflect on your experiences and actually see how you know you might improve yourself so yeah working with animals would be acceptable but as long as you can talk about what you learn from that experience okay that's fantastic and this is the final question now just just because of where we are with time um i think this is something that comes up a lot when when we're, we're talking to students about what they might want to do further in the future so in terms of how you're, and I know you have touched on it slightly in your presentation, but in terms of the course structure, as you get towards the end of the course, you've perhaps got some students perhaps who want to become general practitioners, some that perhaps want to go on and become surgeons or uh, work in mental health or millions of other things. How does that change the, the course structure? Or what, how does that look for the student as they come towards the end of the programme? Um, so in the UK, everybody follows the same program so we work to a document called um, outcomes for graduates which is set by the gmc and they have a list of everything that you have to be able to do in order to receive a medical um, certificate um, how we teach that is um, down to the medical school and um, so everybody does the same we do offer you to um, the opportunity to develop your interests and your particular career aspirations through your SSCs um, that run through the whole course so if you're particularly interested in surgery then you can all you can do your SSCs in, in surgical um, areas so you could build that level of interest but everybody is trained to the same level um, by the, for their medical degree you go into your foundation in your foundation post in the UK, you will experience surgery, medicine, different, um, you will do rotations. So it's still a learning experience. Then once you get your, um, your, um, G, your full GMC registration, you do another year of training, which again is quite similar. And then that's when you start to apply for your specialty training. Fantastic. And just Dr. Jan, for yourself, is, is there anything on your program where you start to branch off into different areas perhaps? It is the same as what David has mentioned. It doesn't make any difference what specialty you like to uh, eventually pursue. Everybody study the same subjects 
uh, graduate with the uh, same minimal requirement. And also everybody will have to proceed to the internship and pass the internship. Well, for, let's say for example, you like to be a surgeon or you like to be a general practitioner or to be internal medicine, you can though sit for the part one exam. Some colleges like the Irish college, the, uh, the UK or Australian college, Malaysia, we have our uh, local colleges. Some they allow you to sit for the part one, which is purely theory at the end of six months after graduation or one year, depends on what requirement they want. You can sit for the part one while you are doing the internship. At the end of your internship, some countries one year, some are two years they require, then you apply to the colleges that you like to specialize in. So if you want to be a surgeon, then you apply College of Surgeon and Physician, College of Physician. But for me, it will be College of General Practitioner. And then they will ask you to fill in and interviews and you start your training and you sit for exam. So in general, um, we, we will do exactly the same up to your internship. You can plan your part one and then apply. And once you are into the program, um, again, you will, you keep your logbook, you sit for exam. After then, if you want to sub-specialize, then you can. Okay. That's fantastic. Thank you. Well, we've, we've come to the end now. I know there are still a few more questions flashing up. Um, do put them um, to me or to, we'll obviously have the email um, addresses of both of our guests if you want to put them to them as well. Um, this has been recorded and it will be put onto our website as well. But I just want to say thank you very much, Dr. Tian. And Dr. Russell, really appreciate your, your time and, and coming on to tell us about stuff. Um, so um, thank you very much. And everybody, if you would like to slowly leave the Zoom call. Um, and if you have any further questions, do just email them on to us and we will do our best to answer them. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.